Welcome to another incredible episode of the Military Millionaire Podcast, and today we have Aaron Masrillo on the show. Now, this is really, really cool because I actually realized as I was talking to him about being on the podcast that I had attended a North San Diego County, uh, San, uh, the Real Estate Investor Association meeting at NSD REI that I go to when, you know, pre-COVID when we could meet in person. And he had left the room, standing room over. We're talking over 100 people at this little meetup to come out to hear him talk. So he is very successful. I had taken some notes on him. Uh, I really enjoyed what he had to say. And the name sounded super familiar. And the moment he got on the recording, I was like, oh, it's you. And so it was really cool for me to get to do this because I really enjoyed hearing him talk. He's got a great, a ton of great information. This is an incredible episode. So be sure to listen to it. If you get something out of it, share it with your friends and as always, and I do not do a good enough job of doing this. Look, the content on these podcasts is free. We would really love if you'd just subscribe and leave us a five-star review if you got something out of it, because that's really all we get out of this. I mean, we this is podcasting. I mean, we get to network. It's fun. It's great. It's whatever. It takes a lot of time, and it's completely free to you guys. So definitely would love a subscribe and a you know share and a five-star review um, or, or whatever, you know, any of those. Uh, it would mean the world to us to show us that uh, what we're doing actually matters and, and helps you guys. So please do that. And I love you all. Have a great freaking day, but don't uh, don't go anywhere till the end of this episode because it's really good. Welcome to the Military Millionaire Podcast, where we teach service members, veterans, and their families how to build wealth through personal finance, entrepreneurship, and real estate investing. I'm your host, David Pere, and together with my co-host, Alex Felice, we're here to be your no BS guides along the most important mission you'll ever embark on, your finances. Vehicle one, you're clear to depart friendly lines. Roger, Vic one, Oscar Mike. Hey guys, before we dig into today's episode, I want to talk to you briefly about the website Carrot or InvestorCarrot.com, which is a website that generates other websites for you. So you can sign up for this, you generate a website, and they create high SEO quality websites for you. Now, yeah, they charge a little bit of fee per month, but what they also do is they produce content like blog posts for you and other stuff. They help you with web design, they help you with ranking on SEO, they help put out articles with you and they help get you to rank in Google. So if you're looking to generate leads where somebody can find you when they type in sell my house fast, Carrot does an incredible job. And I know a lot of wholesalers who do very, very good work and they all love this website. So I'm not going to do it justice. If I try to talk to you about it in, in super detail, I'm fairly new to it. I love it, love it, but I'm fairly new to it. But if you click the link that'll be in the description, you'll get a link to a free, they've got like a free webinar, free demo, whatever. You can check it out if you like it. Cool. If not, whatever. But this is the sponsor for today's episode is Carrot, which I am a big fan of. And have a great day. We're commencing now. What's up, Military Millionaires? I am your host, David Perret, and I am here tonight with Aaron Mazrillo, which is really exciting for me because uh, a friend of mine, Mike, introduced us and I was like, man, that name sounds familiar. And I put it together when he got on the call today as I, I was doing homework that I've actually gotten to hear him speak before at the North San Diego County RIA that I'm a member of whenever we're allowed to meet in person. And it was awesome. So it was really cool because obviously he knows what he's doing. And um, I mean, he alluded to it, but he basically sold the venue out. There was standing room only in the building. And uh, this is pre-COVID, so, you know, social distancing wasn't a thing. Um, but it was a ton of fun to hear. So Aaron uh, did six years in the Navy, and he's done some landlording, some wholesaling, and a little bit of everything up in the San Bernardino, Riverside area. And it's just really fun to be able to uh, have him on the show. So Aaron, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, man. Uh, shameless plug, is that okay? Absolutely. Uh, NSDREI.org, is it? Fantastic yeah. club. So if you're in the Southern California area or you're planning a trip to Southern California, uh, I'm not associated with the club at all in any way, shape or form, but it's a legit nonprofit club. Uh, they just have the best speakers. There's no selling there. It's just phenomenal. Oh, are you, what is that? I've got, I've got guest passes. So if someone's in oh, San Diego, boom, there you go. Person, again, I got <laughs> yeah. you. <laughs> so say, if you're planning a trip to San Diego, like a family outing, just try to schedule it around the, Hey, honey, I need to get away. Or, you know, that can go either way, you know, wife or husband, get away. And, or you're just rolling solo, try to get over there and check it out because it's a fantastic club. I really like that club. So whenever they ask me to speak, I'm like, clean the schedule off. Like definitely got to do that. So. 
I agree. Anyway. Yeah, I've done quite a few meetups, and they're by far the biggest one and, and definitely a lot of fun. Great people. Very good people. Yeah. So. Yeah. Cool. Well, yeah. why don't you uh, tell a little bit of your backstory and your uh, your story for the listeners? Yeah, so I grew up in a small mountain town in the western part of Massachusetts, and people are like, oh, Boston? I'm like, no, hours from Boston, like the woods and sticks of western Massachusetts. Uh, just wanted to escape. I was in high school. I knew I wasn't going to college. My grades weren't very good. Uh, just didn't have a lot of uh, uh, you know opportunities locally in the very small mill town that I lived in. So I actually joined the military. I joined the Navy on my 18th birthday. Uh, so I joined, and then that July, I joined, so my birthday's in December, and that July I shipped off to boot camp, went to San Diego, and I was doing push-ups. I remember being on the grinder uh, in, in San Diego and doing push-ups, and I was just like smiling. I'm like, man, I made the best decision of my life. And I was like, there's palm trees. It was like beautiful weather. Like, I could just stay here forever. It was so amazing. Uh, spent two years there, did all this training, and then they sent me to, well, I volunteered actually to go to Japan. But these guys were just talking about how cool it was. I'm like, man, I joined the Navy to travel. I'm not going to go back to Virginia or, you know, somewhere, uh, you know, there in the West Coast. And I want to go somewhere. Like, I want to do something. So I volunteered. I remember getting my physical to go overseas. And the doctor's like, so going to Japan, huh? And he's like, you know, and I was like, yeah. And he's like, I mean, you seem excited. I'm like, yeah, I volunteered. He just looks at me he's like, you, he's like, nobody volunteers to go to Japan. I'm like, why not? It sounds cool, man. You know, so I went over there and I did two years on the USS Thatch. And uh, I actually got on board the ship in the Gulf. And if you are a history buff at all, I was in boot camp in July of 1990. And they came in and woke us up and said, congratulations, ladies. Uh, Iraq has invaded Kuwait. This happened while I was in boot camp. So uh, so they shipped me to the Gulf. Two years later, we're still involved in that fiasco. In 92, uh, I got on my ship and uh, we just, you know, did circles in the Gulf for a few months and left and went back again. And uh, so I went there three times, actually. And, and then I I finished my tour on the thatch and I went across the pier to the Bunker Hill and I did two years on the Bunker Hill. I moonlighted at MWR. I was working at the 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 club, the base, the enlisted club, bartending and DJing, and I was just always a hustler, you know, trying to make money. And then uh, I got out and I stayed in Japan for like a year, and uh, was teaching English, living near the base. Felt like I was still kind of dependent on the base, and just wanted to kind of break free from the military. So I went to Thailand, and I lived in Thailand for like maybe five months. Yeah, it was like five or six months, just like partied and hung out on this island and had a great time and then ended up in Bali and I was like man I need to do something with my life so I had joined with this idea that I wanted to go to college I knew that so I you know I was like really into the GI Bill and uh, I was like man now it's time to do that I got to go take advantage of this this opportunity so I went back to the states I actually went back to my hometown there's a state college in my hometown and I was at my parents' house because I was basically homeless, you know, and I had all this money that I'd saved up from being in the military. And I was just like, man, what am I going to do? And my dad had an old car in a barn and I drug it up into the garage. And I was working on that at night, just messing around. I was, and I, I took one college class uh, to see if I'd like it. And I did. And I was like, all right. So I just enrolled, used my GI Bill, blasted through college, finished in three years. And I was just like, I just kept thinking in the back of my head about that, that moment in San Diego when I was on the grinder doing those push-ups, And I was like, I promised myself I'd go back to, to, to California and had a couple of yard sales, sold everything I owned. The last yard sale gave it all away, packed up a U-Haul, drove a used Jeep Cherokee to Arizona. It broke down in Phoenix, basically hitchhiked to California and ended up living in a house with a couple other people. One of them was a guy that I was on the Bunker Hill with who had also gotten out and gotten a construction and, uh, started making good money actually in construction. This is the early 2000s now. Uh, so I kind of had an income problem because I was making enough money in construction and I had zero write-offs. So I was paying a lot of taxes and I didn't like that. I didn't like, you know, I like being in the Gulf on the ship where you pay no taxes. That was great. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, that was, <laughs> I was like, man, can we go back to that time? Can I get, make the money I make now in the Gulf? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, I, I think that should be like a veteran's benefit. We just don't have to pay taxes ever again. <laughs> like I like my home Depot. I go in, I'm like that, that, so they give me 10% <laughs> off. I'm just feel like free taxes. You know, I don't pay taxes. Uh, so, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just reminisce. Uh, 
All the guys uh, who re-enlist while they're in a tax exempt zone. It's like, man. oh, fantastic. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. So, uh, I, you know, I come from a military family. I had five brothers and we were all, well, sorry, there's, I have four brothers, but there are five of us and we were all in the Navy at one time. So, uh, uh, I didn't want to make a career out of it. Uh, I enjoyed it, but I just wanted to do other things. And so I, I, I was in, I, I was in uh, California working construction, started making money. And I was asking my CPA, I'm like, man, what do I do? You know, he's just like, well, you know, not much, you know, you're, you're an estimator for a construction company, which is basically, I was putting together the, the, the bids on jobs, the proposals, and I would make 5% of whatever the total, uh, the, the total sales package was. And, uh, they, they, he's like, you have no write-offs, you know, like you can rent a car, lease a car. I was like, great. 300 bucks a month. Like that doesn't help. And, he's, and so I asked, like, well, what do your other, other clients do that are in my situation? He's like, yeah, they buy real estate. I was like, well, I'm going to go buy some real estate then. So, yeah, so I went and bought a, I, I started going on the MLS, like looking online, you know, searches and magazines and trying to find properties. And I contacted a couple of agents and an agent said, hey, I got this house. It's in pre-foreclosure, which means these people are losing the property foreclosure. You want to go look at it? And I was like, yeah. So I drove out to Riverside. I was living in Irvine and I drove to Riverside and Irvine's Orange County, very high end, very nice, you know, the kind of luxurious lifestyle. Not Newport luxurious, but it's nice. Yeah. And I and I drove out to Riverside. And I was like, man, what is going on out here? This is like the Wild West. <laughs> but I, I struck a deal and I bought the house for like it was probably worth two fifty. And I bought it. It was a listed property. You know, nothing. I didn't do any special marketing. I just reached out to agents, and agents are a great source for deals. So uh, I got the house, made an offer, I got it. Uh, I spent the next probably five months coming out here every weekend to Riverside and working on the house myself, which there's benefits and trade-offs to that. I learned a ton, but I wasted a lot of time, right? So if you want to own a gas station, you don't need to learn to pump gas, right? You can hire somebody who already has that skill. But I felt like I really want to learn everything about this business. And I was in construction, although I was doing estimating, I had to go out in the field a lot and I would meet people. So I could hire a guy like, hey, I need a drywaller. And I'd find a guy doing drywall and be like, hey, I'll pay you 150 bucks, come out to my house. And, and, and again, it sat here vacant for five months while I was, you know, trying to learn how to rehab an entire house, but we repiped it. We put in new air conditioning, uh, you know, redid everything, new, all new windows, redid parts of the roof. So I learned so much about the business. And my reason for that was if I learn how to do it, then I'll know whether I'm getting screwed later on or not when I hire people to do it. Right. So, and I never wanted to be the guy who has 20 employees. And although I have close to that now, I never wanted to be that guy. I just wanted to make enough money to go be, be able to wake up any, any day and do whatever I wanted that day. All right. Just wake up and enjoy my day. That's what I wanted. That was my goal. Uh, so uh, we worked on the house. I finally got it rented out. And I was like, man, that was pretty fun. I want to buy another one. And I just kept buying them out of the MLS and getting bank loans. And this was the early 2000s. So it was really easy to get bank loans. Not like it is now. It's very difficult. Even if you're well qualified, it's very difficult to get a loan, which kind of also leads me to believe that, you know, this big recession thing that people believe is coming in the housing market, this bubble, everybody has equity. When in 2007, nobody had equity and everybody had really bad, bad loans, five year interest only, 10 year interest only, or whatever balloons. I mean, really bad. There were all these arms. Nobody, everybody has a 30 year fixed rate under like 5%. And they all have equity. So, so under three and now for, if yeah, it's under yeah, yeah, two and a quarter, two and a half, I mean, it's crazy. So it's going to be hard. And if they lose their house of foreclosure, they have to come rent for me and pay more in rent than they would if they, <laughs> you know, so it's, it's kind of hard to figure out, you know, what's really going to happen. And I don't know, I'm not an economist, so don't call me up after the show and be like, what do you think is going to happen? Like, I have no idea, uh, but I'm just going to keep buying. So yeah, I just started buying houses. And then at, at some point I realized, man, I really like this better than the job that I had. And the job that I had, I was making a, a very good six figure income. Uh, and, and I just decided that, you know what? It, it wasn't about the money. It, like, I think there's this false perception and you always hear money's not happiness, but when you start making good money, if you're not happy, it's, it doesn't help you at all. And there's, to back that point up, there's plenty of extremely wealthy, wealthy people who commit suicide, unfortunately, because they're extremely unhappy. So money is not going to change your life and make you a more happy person. Yeah, it'll solve some problems, but you know, with money comes other problems, right? So um, I, I enjoyed being in real estate way more than I enjoyed in the construction business as an estimator. 
So on, like I found myself Friday sneaking off to go to these landlord breakfasts and I'd go and hang out there for three or four hours, you know, and, and it would stay longer and longer. The first it was like, I'd go for a half hour and come back to the office and, you know, be a good employee and work. And I was there for 45 minutes and an hour and then two hours and three hours. The next thing you know, I'm coming back after lunch, you know, I was like, at just some point I just, I walked in the office and said, you know what, man, I'm just not having fun here anymore. I'm out. So I finished up. It took me probably a year to kind of finish up the projects we have. I wasn't going to just leave the guy, you know, dry. Uh, so I finished all the projects and then I just transitioned full-time in real estate after that. Dude. And here I am today. <laughs> and so much of that story is awesome though. I mean, for one, like the whole living in Japan, living in Thailand, living in Bali, like that alone is really cool. Cause a lot of people talk about travel their whole life and, and never get around to it. So I, I like the fact that you were, had the opportunity. I love Japan. I love, you know, I'd love to go spend some time in Thailand, Bali, um, that was Japan pre Fukushima, so it was really cool. You could drink the water, and you know, <laughs> that's true. Yeah, very, it's, very good. It's point. Changed. <laughs> yeah, it's changed. Yeah, yeah. And then hitchhiked with a Cherokee that broke down all the way out to San Diego. So, like, a lot of that I'm a story. Very goal oriented, goal focused person. <laughs> so. A lot of that story doesn't sound like the makings of success, right? Like, there were several no, opportunities yeah. there to be like, ah, screw this. Uh, and you didn't because you knew what you wanted to do. You wanted to make it to San Diego. You made it to San Diego and you made it work, right? But just really cool, a lot of that. I love the fact that you're like, your problem was an income problem, paying too much taxes, and that's what led you into real estate, right? Like a lot of people get into real estate as like, oh man, I need to make more money, so let me buy real estate. But I think it's they're cool trying to make an income problem. That's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, which is fine. Like, I get that. Yeah, you know, I, yeah I, I'm starting to get to that point where I'm having to get really creative with my taxes because it's like, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Like, I'm looking at checks and it's like the other day I got this check and I'm like, I can't believe I'm like upset about the thing. <laughs> it was like one of those first times where I'm looking at it and like, you need to call my CPA. It's just funny. But, um, Anyways, all that to say, I love that that's what drove you into real estate is your CPA was like, oh, yeah, they buy houses. You're like, oh, well, I'm going to buy a house. And then you did. And you just kept doing it. But how yeah, did that, buy like, at what point, I mean, you you went full time, um, but how did that morph into a full business, right? Like, obviously, like 20 employees now, like, there's there's quite a long way from like, yeah, I'll buy this foreclosed property to 20 employees. What has been kind of your niche through the years to get you there? So in the beginning, like I said, I, I didn't have income. I had a couple of rental houses. I didn't really have income. And for that year, I was tapering off. The the commission checks were going down every month. They're getting smaller and smaller. So uh, I, I was living in uh, the the property that I had in Irvine. I had bought a house in Irvine to live in a primary. Well, we eventually moved into that first foreclosed rental property that I bought on Riverside. So we moved into there. We rented out the house in Irvine. We started buying some other houses over the years. And and then when I quit the job that last year, I really didn't do a lot of working. I did a lot of studying. So I really wanted to focus on my education and learning. And then I just looked for where do other investors go and hang out? I know it's a little bit hard today because they're all on Zoom, but uh, eventually this will pass and you'll be able to go back to meetings. I just went to a lot of meetings. And I mean, by a lot, I don't think a week went by where I didn't drive somewhere to a meeting. And I was going to L.A., San Diego, that's an hour and a half one way. San Diego yeah. for a three hour meetup, uh, you know, on a Tuesday night. So I'm driving to San Diego and LA and Orange County. And, and this was every week I was going to meeting after meeting after meeting. And I was looking for, I was looking for like the most uh, respected educators in the industry. And I don't mean like the guys that are advertising on Instagram or Facebook, like the guys who weren't advertising, but there were, they had a, a, a big following. So guys like Peter Fortunato, John Schaub, Jack Miller, Jack's no longer with us, but Pete and Jack or John still teach. Um, so those three guys, uh, Doug Butterford, kind of this really old school real estate education crew. So I started flying all over the country. I went to Florida and Chicago and uh, Reno a bunch of times in San Francisco, trying to learn what these guys are doing. And during that time, I was also partnering up with investors. I would find another investor at my skill level who maybe had a deal and didn't really know, like he wanted to rehab it, but didn't have an idea. And, and I would partner with him and we would do the deal together. And I did that a bunch of different times. So I'm learning, I'm getting involved in a deal here or there. And it's funny because at some point I got involved in so many, uh, there was a weekly luncheon that I would go to every Tuesday. And there was a bunch of investors that would show up to that. And I was, I, I was a little bit involved in, 
uh, deals with all of them at some point. And one of the guys in the in the the meeting is like, "Hey, there's uh, Pete's going to be speaking in um, in uh, uh, Salt Lake City. You want to do a road trip and drive up there?" I was like, "Man, that sounds really cool, man. I you know, I love road trips. So, all right, we'll do that." So we're driving, and my phone's ringing, you know, and I'm talking to one investor, and then a the phone rings. I talk to another investor, and this is like it's a long drive from Southern California to, to Salt Lake City, and so. He just looks at me. He's like, "Man, you, you you got your arms in everybody. You're like an octopus. You're like in everybody's deals." I was like, "I'm trying to make money. I don't know how to make my own deals." So, but when I would get part like partnered up with a guy, you can ask questions, and if you ask the right questions, you get good answers, right? And so, yeah, there's no such thing as a stupid question, but there's definitely such thing as a better question, right? So, I would ask questions like, "Hey, how did you find it? How did you fund it?" Like, you know, wh what's your exit strategy? What happens if that doesn't work out? What would you do? So, I'm getting all this boots on the ground, you know, in the trenches training by asking all these questions consistently over and over again, like where, where are you getting this deal? So you start to kind of build up uh, a deal flow. And I started to figure out that I could do direct mail and I could get deals that way. Now that's no longer as profitable here in my market. I'm sure it works great in other markets. And there are people here that do it, but I can remember at one time sending maybe 2000 postcards and being overwhelmed with phone calls for two, maybe two, three days. Like so many calls, you would answer the phone and the phone would be ringing while I'm on the phone with another person calling saying, hey, what's this all about? And now it's just like you send 5,000 postcards. You're lucky if you get two people calling you telling you to stop mailing you. It's just, it's changed. It's all texting and uh, cold calling and ringless voicemail. It's, it's completely changed industry. And there's a lot of eye buyers in here too now. So yeah. I went from being one of the bigger mailers in Southern California to now I'm like the uh, one of the guys who buys off other wholesalers. I buy a lot, I bought, yesterday was day tuesday since friday i bought two houses off other wholesalers so uh you know now i'm always looking at and that's if you go on instagram and see i'm always like hey i look for houses wholesalers hit me up i'm like trying to get wholesalers to send me the deals and i buy a lot of crap that people don't the other wholesalers or, or other retailers will pass on because i really know how to retail a house now i i've become very good at figuring out floor plans and knowing what drives the market in in desirability for a house and what attracts people to a house and i'll put a house on the market on thursday and by by uh monday i typically have multiple offers over asking even in the down market when things aren't going well like uh it was pretty flat october november december of 2019 a lot of people are like oh the bubble's bursting it's going to and i just didn't feel that way i'm like no i don't think so i'm gonna keep buying and i was buying a ton of houses back then and I kept getting multiple offers on all my pro uh, all my properties. So uh, it just became very good at 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 designing a house that is very desirable for my specialty is FHA first time home buyers, right? So they don't have a lot of expectations. They're not like fake rich people who are buying in my market. That would be like seven hundred fifty to two hundred fifty thousand. Or I mean, sorry, seven hundred fifty to one point two five million, right? So a million two hundred fifty thousand. Those are people who have a good income but they're not rich, right? So you buy a million dollar house in Southern California, yeah, you make a lot of money, but you're not a rich person, right? Yeah. So a rich person is buying the two million and up house. So I don't cater to the fake rich people. They have too many expectations, too many demands, they're too picky, and they really don't deserve any of that. I like the under, under $500,000 price point. Those people just love a really nice, good, cleaned house where everything's modern and working properly. So, and then we get the home inspections done. We fix everything on the home inspection. I have a, a verbal warranty where I stand behind my house, my product, I call my product because that's what we're pumping out product, right? I stand behind it. If they have a problem, I tell them, call your agent. Don't call your 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 uh, insurance, your, uh, what I don't even know, it's such a scam. This, uh, uh, what's this insurance thing? I can't even think of what it is. I oh, hate it so home much. Home warranties or whatever? Yeah, home warranty. Don't call those clowns. They're not gonna give you any money anyways. Just call me, we'll send the contractor back. We'll fix whatever the issue is. And I've gone back and put new roofs on. I've gone and put new air conditioning in, whatever it takes. I want these people to be extremely happy because I kind of know that in this market with these prices, even though interest rates are low, they're really going all in to buy this product and they don't have any money. And a hot water heater that goes bad three months after they buy a house could cause them to miss their next mortgage payment. Mm -hmm. and, and so I just say, no, it, you know, for me, I made 25,000, 30,000, 50,000 on the house. A hot water heater is a grand. Why would I not go put that back in to have a solid reputation with these people? So I just write the check. We fix the problem. And, and I've done that consistently since I've been in this business. And, and it's helped me to create a great reputation with the products that I sell.
I think that's really cool. And I think that kind of touches on like the idea of, you know, how can I serve more people and how can I serve them better? And that's like, there's all these different philosophies on income, right? And everybody talks about whatever, but I can't remember for the life of me who says it, but uh, you don't get paid. You get paid in direct proportion to the problems you solve, right? And I think that all ties into like income. Like the people who are trying to scrape every dollar out of a house, they might make the money on that. But I think long term, the money is in being a good person, having a good reputation, and and ultimately being able to sleep at night knowing that you're doing the right thing. I think that's really cool that especially in California where I love California, but they're not everybody is quite as generous. Um, and so I think having a reputation that you can stand behind on something like that speaks volumes about you. And that's really cool. And the other thing that you said that I love is the amount of meetups you were going to. And I mean, for, for one, like some of those guys you mentioned are, you know, stand up. I got to hear Pete talk it also at NSD REI for the yeah, first time great. and he's phenomenal. And some of these guys are, you know, brilliant investors, but good educators, good teachers, but I think the fact that you were literally just going out of your way every week to meet with people in different markets, driving all over the place to network, 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 and learn and get with these people. I mean, that's really cool. And it just goes to show how powerful being around the right people can be for you and your business. So that's, yeah, that's awesome. Man. So I, I knew early on the type of house that I wanted to rent and that made a good rental. And, and if you think about it, like a two to three bedroom Four bedrooms kind of pushing it. That's a lot of people running around doing a lot of damage to your property. Two to three bedroom, one to two bath, single story with a garage, preferably detached in case they burn it down. Um, you know, middle of the street on a, on a lot that's similar to all the neighborhoods. So here in California, we're lucky that we have lots and lots of track housing, right? So you can have a house that looks like basically 500 other houses, right? So it's easy to comp out. Uh, when you get into that, and, and most of them are built like after 1950, 1950s yeah. to 1970s, you know, the, the, I mean, they're still within track houses today, but they're all like McMansions they are 3000 square feet and two yeah. stories tall. I, I mean, those would be great to have as rentals, but I like single story, less problems, cheaper to fix the roofs. So if you look at that product in my market here, our market in Southern California, uh, it's it's easy to buy. It's easy. Everything in the house can be bought at Home Depot to repair it, right? And there's yeah. no specialty granite. There's no nothing, right? You don't need special windows or Anderson windows where they're a thousand dollars. Everything can be bought off the shelf at Home Depot. You can rent them. You can sell them. Right? You can wholesale them. I've wholesaled rental houses I've owned just because I was tired of owning them, right? Like, like I don't, I don't want to deal with it. I don't want to deal with the tenant. I call up one of my investor buddies and he's like, write me a check, dude. What, tell me, tell me what works for you. And I bought it at a wholesale price because I'm a wholesale buyer. I'm not no longer buying out of the MLS at, at the listed price. Uh, so there was always room in there, but uh, my philosophy has always been leave a little meat on the bone for the next guy. And if you do that, you're never going to have to look over your shoulder. Nobody's ever going to be stalking you or coming back and saying, Hey, you screwed me. And, and that's just what I want. I want a nice, easy life and make it, ton of rental income now i have lots of dozens and dozens of tenants all here in southern california so and if, you know if you look at the median uh price point of a house you know i own lots of them uh and, and it's just been and, and i like small apartment buildings too two to four units uh they're great you get multiple incomes off one property i'm not a big fan of the adus i think they're cool in certain markets like la and probably riverside but when i'm buying 400 500 thousand dollar houses in riverside the idea of trying to convince this person who's going to write me a $2,000 rent check that they can't use the garage because somebody's living in it and it's another house and maybe you have to park on the street sometimes, it just doesn't fly. Like, you know, yeah. and I don't want to deal with the headaches and there's noise complaints and all stuff. I just want, I, I don't know. And at some point in the future, if there's a bunch of ADUs, maybe my house even has more value because I don't have somebody living in the garage, right? So, so I don't, you know, in LA where people are used to that high density living, that's probably a great product there, but I can't imagine being in, in Irvine and putting an ADU and telling these people, yeah, I don't know where you're going to put your, your, you know, your toys because the garage is, you know, got some dude living in it. So it's just, I, I'm not sold on it yet. Well, I can speak to that in the fact that I, so I didn't, I didn't buy when I moved here. When I, when I landed in San Diego, the VA loan still had the limit. And so I was like, nothing I really wanted. I wanted to do like a duplex, triplex. And they were, they were just all out of the price range that I could get with the VA loan that would qualify for 
the VA loan and also, you know, would actually be something I could house hack. So I found a place that I could rent and I convinced the landlord to let me sublet. And I was like, awesome, this is great. So I got a little four bedroom home in a newer neighborhood. I've got an office, I've got a master, and then I rent two bedrooms. And it's been great. I live for basically free in San Diego County, Oceanside, like it's wonderful. But I can absolutely attest to like, I don't even have an ADU. I just have two bedrooms that I Airbnb and um, I park, you know, 150 yards down the street most not times. fun and it drives <laughs> doesn't me rain here walk. often but when it does rain that's a miserable walk <laughs> yeah so it's like you know i'm the guy paying the lease on this and this stinks like thank goodness <laughs> it's not someone who's renting from me because that would they would just be done like they yeah, yeah. um and then the other thing is uh, that you mentioned you know you you kind of alluded to like you own a lot of houses in you know riverside or whatever but i mean the riverside and san Bernardino area like the market there for the last few years has been I don't know if nuts is the right word because uh, to a lot of the listeners anywhere in California would be considered nuts for uh, appreciation, but uh, man, that market's come up a ton. So I, I have a house that I just bought. It's in San Bernardino that I'm going to retail for 400 grand. And the idea that somebody's going to pay almost half a million dollars to live in San Bernardino just blows my mind. Yeah. It's, it's a half a million dollars. I mean, it is, half a million dollars just isn't worth what it used to be anymore. <laughs> if you're going to pay that much money to live in San Bernardino, that's, that's amazing. Like I was shocked when they were paying a quarter million to live in San Francisco. I was like, that's a rough area, you know, like the uh, Ocean bad front? government. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ocean front three hours West or actually yeah, it's, it's, it's not that it's far brutal but... out there. It's brutal. So yeah. Oh man. That's awesome. So you've got, you said close to 20 employees now. Is that uh, like contractor property management all in house? Did you go kind of vertical with everything? So I, I have one, assistant, I have an acquisition person and I have a marketing guy. So those people are around me all the time. Uh, well, the, the acquisitions guy and the marketing guy, we, the, the acquisitions guy used to come to the office every day, but in, with COVID he's, you know, he came in today, he's going to come in tomorrow, but he's been coming a lot less, which is fine. Yeah. He can work remotely. Uh, the marketing guy comes in once a week. Uh, and then, yeah, so I have a full-time maintenance guy. Just, I mean, he works almost seven days a week just to deal with property maintenance because I have a, enough properties that it, it takes a full-time guy. Yeah. Um, and then he has an assistant that helps him. And then there's uh, two licensed general construction companies that primarily just do my stuff, my rehabs. So they do some other stuff once in a while. And, you know, they're trying to clean up some other deals that they had that are still ongoing since before they started working with me. But Primarily, they just rehab my houses because I have enough inventory and we're constantly buying that I can do at any given time. I like to be rehabbing about 10 houses here. Yep, that's that's a lot of inventory. That's a lot of houses to be. Uh... Yeah, and that's not 10 a month. You know, I mean, like we'll sell two this month, but we'll pick up. I have two in escrow that I'm selling, but I just bought two more. So I just try to keep it at around 10. Uh, more than that, it just gets really hectic. I would need to hire another assistant probably. And I just don't want to get probably much bigger than that. I really like the level that I'm at right now. It's very, com it's like a nice pair of walking shoes. It's very comfortable, not too fancy. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, you know, they're not open toed or anything where I'm like too laid back, but yeah. So it's just, it's very comfortable. The income's really good. Uh, so I, I like being at about 10 flips per at a time, not per month at a time. So. Yeah. Reasonable. Uh, what is, what's next for you? Do you know, do you plan any plans to uh, retire? Are you still, do you, is it, is it like a lot of people I interview where real estate has almost become a hobby as well and you just enjoy doing it or is it a means to an end? So I, I think retiring is, I don't know. It's like this whole idea of quitting. Yeah. If you have a job, you can retire from because you want to quit, right? You just don't mm -hmm. want to be there anymore. Like, so I can, like you're in the Navy for 20 years. I can understand like, dude, I don't want to go to sea again. Right? Yeah. I want to, I want to retire. I want to quit. I'm out. They won't give me shore duty for another 20 years. I'm out. <laughs> right? yeah, so, yeah. But you know, like I go on vacation and I think about, man, how many deals am I missing out on right mm -hmm. now? How many five, you know, five figure deals am I missing because I'm, you know, here messing around and I'll talk to one of my friends like, man, I pick up this house, they wholesale it for $50,000. I'm like, oh man, what? Like in Riverside, I, man, I know that house. I look at my list. I'm like, I was marketing to that. I, mm -hmm. They might've called me, you know? So it, yeah, you could definitely become a deal junkie. And it's fun though. It's a lot of fun because, you know, it's, it doesn't take a ton of time. I can get a cold seller. Uh, somebody who calls me on the phone, like it's a cold lead. They just, you know, inbound. So it's not technically cold. You know, they're calling because I marketed to them, but I don't know anything about them. And they can call me and I can have an offer to them within 10 minutes over the phone. 
So, you know, I just, I, have, I just need two screens so I can kind of look at comps and all that. And I'm a broker, I'm a licensed real estate broker. So I have, I control my own access to the MLS, which is extremely important. I'm not looking on Zillow or Redfin trying to guess what the value of this house is. No. I can get the best data, right? I can go into the MLS. I can see what the houses that sold for within a half mile, within the last 180 days that are within 20% square foot range, right? So I'm, I have absolute control over my my data, right? And and it's a data driven business. It absolutely yeah. is a data driven business. And anybody says, well, you know, look at Facebook. They sell nothing. They're just the. I mean, they know everything about everybody. They're a data provider to all these marketing companies, and that's why they're worth billions and billions of dollars. We are in yeah. a data driven world, so you have to have clean, uh, reliable data. And if you have clean, reliable data, you can do a lot of business with that. So, I mean, from building marketing lists to acquiring deals, uh, you know, uh, evaluating deals, estimating rehab, you really need to have the best data out there. So, yeah, that's really cool. I, I know a lot of people get their their real estate license because they want to, you know, dual hat, maybe save some money on commission. But I, I think that's that. I mean, that makes sense. That's cool. That's no, great. give the money away. Give the money away on the commission. Let somebody else go do that. Yeah, <laughs> like I, I do it on say... selling. So I sell, right? And I save tens of thousands of dollars a year because I sell my own houses. But I time myself one day. Like, I, you know, I'll have, I'll go out and take the pictures because I want to do a final walkthrough where I'll have my contractor take the pictures. And then I put it in the MLS. It takes minutes to put a property in the MLS and write some cool copy. Like, wow, amazing. Check this out. Like, you can go to my properties. You guys want to check it out. Go to Redfin and put in 847 I think it's East Hoffer, H-O-F-F-E-R. Um, I don't know what it is, Ab Street or something. 847 East Hoffer in uh, Banning. This is one that is in escrow right now that I just finished. I paid, I don't even remember, like 125 or something for it. I don't remember what we paid for it. Selling it for 237. I listed it at 220. We're selling it for 237. What are the little praise for? I don't know. But you can look at the pictures of it and the description. It, there should be a description there. I took those photos. I'm not a professional photographer. I used an iPhone. You just take good photos, like, you know, they kind of stand back and raise it up high and, you know, get views like that. I mean, it's so easy to do this stuff. And right, like, imagine you're trying to sell a house for, you know, a $50,000 check. You're going to write good copy. You're just like, honey, stop the car. It's just nonsense. And it really, they need to update that to honey, stop scrolling. Right. And they still see that honey, stop kind of want to punch these people. It's like, it's not 1990 anymore. Honey, stop scrolling. They're looking online. Right? Yeah, <laughs> let's, yeah, get with, yeah. let's get with the, you know, the, the 2000s. So, uh, you know, so I put it in the MLS and it takes minutes, minutes to do this. And then uh, I'll pay, you know, two, two and a half, three percent commission. And, and then when they send an offer over, we'll review the offers. Me and acquisitions guy, will review them together. He's a licensed agent. We'll review the offers together. We pick out the best one. Again, you would have to do that anyways, if you, unless you're going to yeah. put it off on a disposition person, which is a completely waste of money in your office. You should not have a disposition person. They they do nothing and they get paid way too much money for it. Right? <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I, I know people like, oh, I got a disposition person to handle my wholesale deals. Like, what are you talking about? You send an email. That's how you sell a wholesale house. Like, you don't need a disposition. Make your acquisition guy do it. He can do both. Like yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. Right? So make it. And they're like, well, who follows up on the paperwork? That's escrow's problem. Make them do that. You're paying them like fifteen hundred bucks. Let them deal with that stuff. Absolutely. So, um, so uh, the offer comes in, and then disclosures. I sat down and taught myself. And if there's any state the the worst than you for disclosures, it's got to be California. Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a thirty day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash military millionaire. Now, why Audible? Audible content includes an unmatched selection of audiobooks, original audio shows, news, comedy, and more from the leading audiobook publishers, broadcasters, and entertainers. I listen to Audible every single day on my commute to and from work. Now, to download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash military millionaire. I mean, oh, yeah. we literally have a market conditions advisory. Like we have to tell you that we don't know if the market's going to tank tomorrow. It's insane here, right? <laughs> so it's nice all, sometimes, yeah. Yeah, all these disclosures, I have them in. It, uh, there's this thing called Zip Forms. Comes with your real estate agent's license if you become a member of uh, California Association of Realtors. So uh, you, you can have them all saved, and I have them saved, and I just go in and I time myself from going in and filling out the property address, and it cascades through all the forms property address, the name of the buyer, the name of the seller, which is my company. And it's already in there because it's saved. I just got to change some dates and then put in the, the selling agent. So you have the listing agent is the person who puts it on the market. And the selling agent is the person who brings the buyer. 
You have to put the selling agent's office information in there and then download these as a PDF. And, and there's probably an easier way to do this, but I'm not tech savvy. I upload them to DocuSign and I go through and I click all the boxes, 20 minutes. Yeah. And people are paying agents two and a half percent. On, you know, if you sell a $500,000 house, that is $12,500 for 20 minutes of work. Why would you do that? I would no, I just, I'm going to, I'm going to do that myself. That job, I don't mind having. 37, easy, five so. an hour. What a steal. Yeah. You're killing it. Right. And, and they, all agents have the put, put, pray method, put a sign on the front lawn, put it in the MLS, pray some other agent brings a buyer along. Right. Yeah. So I, and, and we don't even put signs in our properties anymore because those are the ones that get vandalized and broken into. So True. yeah. It, you don't even have just, to pray right now. You just got to put it on the MLS and wait like 48 hours. Not even that, that day people will be calling you. The market's so hot that day. People are calling yeah. like, Hey, we're going to show it tomorrow. Is that okay? I'm like, go for it. Yeah. So yeah. I remember six months ago, people saying like you said, uh, see, well, it's probably closer to a year ago. Now everybody was worried. The bubble was going to pop and California was going to tank and the market's slowing. I remember sitting in the, that same real estate meetup where they do the monthly market updates and they talking about the market. And he was like, no, nah, I don't think so. I think we're going to be good. And then this happens. And it's like, holy smokes, California just jumped. Like, not. Yeah, I never expected that. I actually thought COVID would be a killer, right? It would like wipe everybody out. But now everybody's like vacating the cities. I'm like, I need a yard. I'm tired of sitting in my my luxury apartment and having no yard and the pool's closed and the gym's closed and I can't do anything. And so, you know, everybody's vacating the cities and coming out and buying houses with backyards. So, it's been phenomenal for, for flippers. I, I don't know anybody who's not making money if they're flipping houses. They're all, they're all just like all of us, man, I wish I had more inventory. I do know people that are now starting to slow down because the election's a little bit, a little bit mm -hmm. scary. Don't know yeah. what's going to happen. You know, we don't know. It's going to be crazy. And, and I think that the election is also going to have an effect on all these foreclosures. And are they going to have this drawn out longer? I mean, we just don't know. We don't know. I so, agree. A lot of unknowns out there. So yeah. I think, I, I just want to go back to kind of like I started talking about earlier, but I, I, I jumped away from it. It's all about intention and focus, right? So I told you the type of houses I'm looking to buy. Yeah. So I have a couple that I'm doing that are in that five to $600,000 range. I don't like to do those because I don't want to be stuck with a $550,000 fully rehabbed rental house, right? Or have to sell it at a significant discount to get rid of it and not have to make the payment on it every month, right? So if you're in a, in a cash flow position where, you know, cash flow, it, it goes both ways, right? It's positive and negative. So if you're in a, you know, a neutral or a negative cash flow situation and you have this very expensive rehab that the only exit strategy was to retail it and the market starts slowing down and prices are dropping and you got to be the new next low comp, that could be financially, that one deal could be financially devastating, right? But if you're buying in, if your intent is like, and my intent always was, I want to be a landlord. I want to own a lot of rental properties. So the properties I'm buying and flipping fit that model, right? I'm always looking for that property. That's what I want to buy. That's who I market to. When the phone rings, it's what I want to buy, even though I have no idea which, what the address is, because I'm targeting that property, right? I'm looking yeah. for that two to four bedroom, 800 to 1600 square foot, single story. I don't want a swimming pool. I don't want solar panels. I mean, you can't search for that. I don't want stuff in senior communities. I want residential track housing. So I'm targeting that product. So if the market tanked, like just full on deflated, I'm just going to rent the house out and somebody will rent it because it's yeah. in a good school district or it's affordable. It's better than the apartment they're living in. They got that another kid on the way and they need to get out of the apartment. They want to get out of mom and dad's house, whatever it is. There's always a demand. It's the most highly desirable piece of real estate in the world, right? A three bedroom, one bath, three bedroom, two baths, single story track house. There's nothing that is more desirable than that. I mean, yeah, there's, you know, the 50,000 square foot luxury mansion, highly desirable, but totally unattainable and unaffordable for 99.9% .9 of the world. So it's not even consideration. That is the most in-demand product, that single story track house, right? And two stories are cool, but I hate walking upstairs. I'm pretty lazy. So um, I mean, I work out, but I just don't want to do extra stuff, right? <laughs> so yeah, well, Sometimes after my workout, stairs is the last thing I want to do. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> you know, so, like day. <laughs> so it's interesting you say this, and I, I, I meant to talk about it earlier, but because it is, it is a very, very, very smart thing, right? To know exactly what you want. So Warren Buffett talks about a strike zone and he's got like this whole article about it. I love it. And he's like, look, major league pitchers or major league batters, like, 
they don't necessarily know every time like where the pitch is going to be. They can't like, you know, people think they can read everything, but the reality is they have a strike zone. They have an area and they know if it's looks like it's going to be in that area, I'm swinging the bat. Like, yep. May hit may miss, but if it's in that area, and that's basically what you've done. You've said, Hey, look, these are my parameters. If it's in here, I'll strike. If it's not, it could be the best thing in the world. Probably going to pass. Doesn't fit, doesn't, doesn't fit my box. Right. And I think that's really smart. I think a lot of investors, and I'm guilty too. Like I, I like buying and buying holds and I've, I've dabbled in things that I probably didn't need to because and some of them worked out fine. Right. But because they were shiny object syndrome or they were a decent deal. But when you set like, this is exactly what I want, like this zip code, this, you know, um, God, it's amazing how much more successful you can be because you know what you're getting and you, you have an exit strategy. You have like, everything's lined up and you've got different options you're not throwing curveballs at yourself. So I think that's really smart, really good advice for people. There's riches in niches, not niches. No. There's not riches in niches. There's <laughs> riches in niches, okay? So if you looked at my rental portfolio, it would be like looking at the same house. I mean, it's not exactly but like single story track house, single story track house, single story, over and over and over and over again. I mean, that's just, it, it, that's what I like. And every time I got one, I hate to sell it, but sometimes, you know, you got to eat, right? So uh, I, I, and, and I will buy them, but if, if they're in a market that I don't want to own rentals in, then they're automatically going to the flip pile. Like, nope, that's a flip property. I don't have any rentals in that city. I don't want to start now. I, I, this city is where I buy my rentals and I want to keep them. And I have a lot of stuff in good neighborhoods. I also have a lot of stuff in really, really bad D and F neighborhoods, right? But they fit that model still. It's the single family on a track in a similar like kind neighborhood, so I know that I can find good people who just can't afford to live anywhere else. And I bought it at such a wholesale smoking price, I can still keep it as a rental and make money on it. And those properties do go up in value. You know, they don't accelerate as fast as other properties, but you can get good long-term tenants. I mean, like 10, 15 year tenants who move into there and they raise their kids. I have a property now that's not in the best neighborhood. Uh, these, the family moved out. Their son who moved in as a child is now 18 and he's renting the property from me at zero days turnover, zero. Wow. Right. And I'm now I'm on the second generation of tenants in the same house. So that's cool. And, and as far as like what I, what I look for, the strike zone, I had a guy show you on my phone. I had a guy text me today. He's like, Hey, I got this house. It's kind of weird. I don't know if you're into it, but check it out. It's a circular house. It's in a neighborhood of track houses, but it's a circular house. And it's really cool. And, and, you know, it's like really neat looking, beautiful ceilings, you know, but and I was like, nah, it's probably not for me. And, and he's like, well, would you flip it? And I was like, nah, I just don't, I, if I got stuck with it, what do I do with it? I don't want to rent out a circular house. I don't want to deal with that. Right. Not for me. He's like, well, what would make you interest? I'm like, I don't know, like 0% seller financing, you know? And he's like, all right, let me see what I can do. And I'm like, you know, there was a delay and I was like, texting back. I'm like, yeah, I, I just, that's not my deal, dude. I'm, I'm out. I'm not interested in that. I'm like, if the house were at Joshua Tree, where I could Airbnb the circular mm, house near the park, yeah. maybe, yeah, there's a niche there. and But I'd probably still package it up and wholesale it to somebody else because it's just not my thing. It, it doesn't fit in my, you know, circles, circles and uh, pegs and circle holes, square pegs. It just doesn't fit in there. It's a circle peg and I like square holes, right? So I just square pegs and square holes. I just want, I want that product. I'm hyper-focused on it. I buy and flip a lot of stuff that is in, in the world of that product. Uh, but if they're in markets outside of my primary market, they're absolutely they're on the flip pile and I'm not going to keep them. So the idea is to start Riverside and grow my equity up, start in San Bernardino, grow my equity up, migrate to Riverside, keep growing my equity, migrate closer to the coast. And then maybe eventually I'll have like five free and clear houses within a couple blocks of the beach or something. Right. So I just, yeah. I, 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 I knew I didn't want to keep a bunch of, low end rental houses in bad neighborhoods, but surprisingly they've treated me very, very well. And I take really good care of the houses. So it'd make it very difficult for the tenants to move out. They, they've had nothing but bad landlord experiences their, their entire career as tenants. They move into one of my houses. Like we fix everything all the time. I put new roofs on, we put nice windows in, we put air conditioning in, we take care of the houses. They just stay and pay. And that's all I want. I want stay, pay and refer. That's my business model. Stay, pay, and refer. Stay, Stay, pay, pay, and tell your friends. When your friends are looking, they come talk to you. You're texting me right away. Hey, you got anything else vacant? I have a friend. Like, no, but I'll go look for something. You know, maybe I'll find (laughs) a house. Somebody listening to this probably just like screamed internally when they heard you turn down a potential 0% seller financing deal. But that speaks to your niche, and that's spot on. 
right? It, and that's not to say that a single family track house is everybody's niche, right? Obviously, people have different niches. It's different for different people for different yeah. goals, whatever. But there is definitely power in becoming an expert in what you know and sticking to it and, and just knowing, you know, hey, like, this is what I do. Maybe that deal's great for someone else, but it's not my thing. Yeah, not not for me. It's probably a great deal, but it just doesn't, it's far away. It's in a city where I own no rental properties and I don't want to have to go out there. One The one time I have to go out there for whatever reason, I'm going to be <laughs> cursing myself the entire way going, what, why did I keep this stupid house? No. What was I thinking, right? And then I'm just going to call one of my friends and try to offload it, like get it out of my life. I just don't want to deal with it anymore. Yeah. And I'm going to wholesale it, right? So I, I, if you're hyper-focused, you know exactly what you're going after. You know, it's, it's, I'm a huge fisher, fisherman, love to fish. Like I'm addicted to fishing, hat. right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm addicted to fishing. Uh, real estate is a lot like fishing. If I called you up and said, Hey, let's go fishing. Right. You, for what? I mean, yeah. do I need to bring <laughs> rubber boots, waders, uh, you know, sleeping bag? Are we going over, are we going to hiking in the outback or, you know, the, or the back country? Yeah. Are we going to the ocean? I mean, right? You should know what you're going at. What are you targeting? Like, what's your bait? What are you targeting? What's your exit strategy? Or is it catch and release? Are we going to fillet these bad boys and eat them? Are we going after carp in the LA river? I mean, what are we doing here? Right? So think of it in that, in terms of that, right? Like you're going to go out and do real estate. What do you really want to do? And if you really want to do something, then focus on that and don't be distracted. I actually got into single family by accident. I wanted to be in multifamily, but at the time I got into real estate, there wasn't a whole lot of multifamily uh, information. I mean, Facebook wasn't a thing in the early 2000s, yeah. right? There was no social media in early 2000s, which seems crazy, but it wasn't that long ago. Yeah. There was no social media, right? Uh, I remember yeah, I went to work at this huge. company. Yeah, I went to work at this company in 2002. That's this you know, century. And they had nothing but facts. Nobody was using I bought the domain name for the guy for his birthday because I was tired of sending faxes. I'm like, dude, we got to send an email. This is insane. Right. That wasn't that long ago. That was this century. Right. So, yeah. uh, uh, you know, I wanted to do multifamily, but there was nobody teaching multifamily. There's a couple guys out there, but nobody that like was really accessible. You had to fly and go to seminars and, you know, I just like, eh, like researching properties. It just wasn't a lot of ability to, to get that information unless you were traveling and going to look at cities and stuff. I didn't want to do with that. So, Single family was so easy to get into that I ended up getting sucked into that that single family investing strategy. And it's easy to surround yourself with dozens and dozens of amazing single family uh, educators and and other investors. And, and one day, it wasn't that long ago, maybe a year ago, I I I dude, my sorry, my daughter's in. I'm, this is being recorded. Please go. My daughter just got out of the shower and she's four, so we don't want her on the video. Come on, go. <laughs> so sorry. Uh, no, no worries. So. Uh, uh, I, I lost my focus because it was so easy to, to get surrounded. And you can have a fun. I know a guy uh, actually we're doing a deal right now and he's got one, I think his net worth is like $1.4 billion. He lives here in Southern California and he owns like 16,000 units. Like you can make a fortune in single family housing. So um, please get her out of here. Please get her out of here. Please go, go. Thank you. Um, you can make a fortune in single family housing. Uh, but I wanted to do multifamily. So I kind of had this awakening, like, man, what am I doing? Like, I want to do multifamily. This is crazy. So I, I started to focus back on that again this year. And so I got my eight unit apartment building that I'm doing and I think, uh, and I'm building them. So I'm not, I'm not buying existing stuff. I'm oh, like, re yeah. So it's redevelopment and that's what I like to do. So I have in the works to do a 10 unit, not far from my house where I have a three unit now that I'm going to bulldoze and build a 10 unit. So I have, I, I'm moving back into what I originally wanted to do in the first place. That's cool. I like that you're able to do that. Um, I'm just, I think that's kind of path of progress, but I mean, you found something, you stuck to it and it worked and now you're continuing to grow and continue to enjoy your life. And that's huge. So that's incredible. All right. So I got a few questions that I always ask every guest, right? Two or three questions. No worries. Fairly, fairly easy ones. Uh, the first and I don't know what they are, so they're not rehearsed. So I don't know. No, no, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I kind of like that. Uh, they're, they're. Don't ask me what kind of yeah. tree I want to be or something stupid like that. I don't know. <laughs> what is your spirit? No, uh, no. The first one's, uh, you know, what if an E one, E two, or eighteen, nineteen year old was to walk up to you, just asking for advice, whether that's for getting started in real estate or just life advice in general. Like, what's the one thing that you would tell them that you kind of wish you'd known when you were that age? There's a period of sacrifice, and we're all going to pay it. We're all going to go through it. You can decide to do it now when you're young, and it's not so difficult, or you can do it when you're old, 
but at some point you're going to go through that period of sacrifice and i highly recommend you you do it now while you're young and it's much easier you might miss out on some of the social aspects of it but i can assure you that you know the partying and all that stuff it's just as fun when you're in your you know 40s and 50s as it is when you're in your 18s and 20s it's just as fun right but it's fun on a better level because you know, now I can go back to my thousand dollar room hotel room, you know, <laughs> I can go back to my suite and crash at your room service and not care what the bill is and not look at the prices. So it's a lot more fun at this age when you have money than it is when you're 18 and broke and you got to ride back home from Vegas at three in the morning because you couldn't afford a hotel. So there's a period of sacrifice, right? If you're, if you're looking to get into this business, uh, really like get some financial education, learn about a financial calculator, the 10 B two, right? The Hewlett Packard 10 B two. There's an app you can get. There's a book invest in debt by Jimmy Napier, get the book, get the app. I got mine from in a day development. It's on my iPhone. Learn how to use a financial calculator. It'd be one of the most powerful tools in, in real estate and in managing your money that you've ever used before. It just teaches you about the time value of money. So, Learn about money. Learn that money is not just for trading or entertainment or, or goods and services. There's so much more to that. I was talking to one of my private lenders today and I have like millions of dollars of this guy's money and I'm not getting around. I have millions of dollars of money. And he, he's like, hey, I got 300 grand. You have a home for it. And I was like, I'll find a home for it. So I found a deal that's actually, I'm paying 325. So he calls me up. He's like, hey, you're like, well, let's do this deal. I'll lend you, you know, 270,000. I'm like, great. Uh, you know, so I'm like, you got the best job ever. He's like, what's that? I'm like, you just, all your employees are dollar bills and you just a hundred dollar bills. You just send them to work and they come back and they never complain. They don't need health insurance and they always bring back friends, right? They always bring back more, more, more employees to work for you. It's the best job ever. So your money can make you a lot of money and you can have a fabulous life just managing your money. Right. And, and that it's a full-time job when you, when you have no money, you know, it's like uh, you hear people bragging about, Oh, I got an 18% return or a 30% return. So I always ask, well, how much did you invest? And if, you know, the amount is under six figures. I'm probably not interested because I'm not impressed by an 18% return on five grand. Right. That's easy. That's easy. I can do that every day, all day long. That's easy. Get an 18% return on 18 million or 10 million. Right. You, you, you'll be the richest guy in the world. Right. But Bernie Madoff, he only promised 8%. And they gave him billions of dollars like this. Take it. I don't know. 8%. That's phenomenal, right? So it, 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 it's so difficult and time consuming to manage large volumes of money. So if you learn about money, people will pay you phenomenally well. So I pay 10%. So I have millions of dollars of money of a friend of mine, and he makes 10% interest only, no points on his money doing business with me. I'm essentially his money manager, even though I'm not a manager. I just put in the deals, I pay him interest, and then I flip the deals and I make the profit. And, and the other thing is, you know, when you're first starting out, when you're getting going in the real estate, a lot of people will like, they'll want to lend you money and they'll bait you like, yeah, I'll give you the money and, you know, give me 50% or something. And my response always was money makes interest, knowledge, knowledge earns profits, right? So look, you want to put money in a deal? Great, but it's my deal. I'll pay you interest. I'll pay you some points if I have to. And that's the end of it, right? We're going to go in knowing what you're going to get up front. I'm not going to give you a cut of the backside. If you got no deals, a slice of pie is better than no pie, right? But as you start to accumulate knowledge and deal flow, you need to get those people out of your life because they're just too greedy. There's plenty of people out there with tons of money who will do business with you. If you can just show them, hey, your money's going to be secure. It's going to be safe. We're going to do it through escrow. It's never going to touch my hands. And, and I'm going to take care of you. And, and they're not lending your deal money. They're lending you money, right? You're the, you're the asset. It's not the house. It's you. It's your personality. It's your ability to perform and keep your word. And above everything, I'm a man of my word. So if I say I'm going to do something, I do it, but I do it when I say I'm going to do it, right? So that's to me, the most important thing is you, you do what you say you're going to do and you do it when you say you're going to do it. So there's a lot there. I don't know. It's, you know, a lot of, a lot of things going on there, but a lot of you know, really good things going on. That was solid. Yeah. It's yeah, you learn a lot about money, like get out there and just, just study what it does and what it can do for you. And it's not about just trading it for good. Yeah. You can, you know, you can go get watches and cars and all that crap. Right. But that stuff doesn't improve the quality of your life. And going back to what I said earlier, it's not going to make you any happier. It's not right. So uh, you know, we all makes me happy. I live in a 1200 square foot track house. I can easily afford a much better house easily. And it will not cause me any financial distress. 
but I, I'm not, I, I don't want to impress other people. This suits my needs, but I'm fry. I, I work. I drop, I drive my daughter to school. I work a couple hours. I go and pick her up. I take her to sports every day. She's four. I take her to karate horse, private horse riding lessons. She doesn't do group stuff, uh, ballet lessons. And I'm involved in all that stuff every day to me. Uh, how you put a price on that? Yeah. Right. And she's going to classes like three o'clock. I drop her off at nine. I go to my office, I have a little small office. I have an assistant who's in there, bang out some deals, catch up with some paperwork. I go and pick my daughter up. I leave at 2.30. So my hours is every day, like, well, four days a week are 9 to 2.30. And then I, on Fridays, I go meet my buddy who's got a, a very expensive boat parked in the harbor. And we go out fish every Friday. And we go after, you know, bluefin tuna and yellow tan tuna. And we do this constantly. And it's all about experiences because that's the stuff you take with you. If you give your daughter $100, is she going to remember that you gave her a hundred dollars or is she going to remember that you took her to Disneyland that day and you went and on all these rides, what are you going to remember? Like, I don't, I, I mowed lots of lawns when I was a kid. I can't remember a single dollar that I ever had from mowing lawns. I can't remember, but I remember that I saved enough money that I flew myself to Florida when I was in middle school and went to Disneyland. Right. I remember that experience. Right. So life's about, it's about banking experiences and you can bank a lot more experiences when you don't have to get up and chase dollars. Man, I love all of that. Uh, the experiences, I'm a huge believer in that uh, period of sacrifice. I don't know that I'd heard it put quite that way before, and I love it. I, Yeah, a lot of people get washed out with the, I kind of joke with the BMW phase, below minimal wage when you're when you're hustling away. Um, but BMW, right. I like that. I've never heard that before. That's great. I can't, I can't take credit for that, but uh, yeah. I don't know where when I, I heard When it, I but. pull up in, in San Bernardino and I see a guy with a you know $80,000 car, I just think, you got your priorities all mixed up, buddy. <laughs> like yeah. I want you as a tenant because you're never moving out. <laughs> yeah, and I will plug that. Uh, invest in debt is definitely a book worth reading for anyone, especially if you're interested in notes. But just in in how mortgages and notes and lending and money works in general, it's uh, it's not necessarily the easiest book to get your hands on these days. It cost me like forty bucks to get a hard copy of it. But no, no, no. Uh, uh, Gary Johnston, I think it's JohnstonSeminars.com. I think that's the website. Uh, he bought the rights to all Jimmy Napier stuff, or he got transferred all the rights to Jimmy Napier stuff before Jimmy passed away. And he he sells the book, and you can get it from him for like I think it's like eighteen bucks. Oh, well, they're yeah. all right, so, very well. And it's updated, and it's updated too, so it doesn't have the thing about you know adjusting for the interest rate like the old book had. You had to go in and divide it by twelve or whatever. So you can get an updated version of the book. It's like a hundred pages, and you can teach yourself how to figure out amortization schedule. You can teach yourself. And then Gary Johnson is a fantastic old school style educator. And he will teach you, he has seminars, he has a, a weekly, like a weekly email. I think it's like Monday thoughts or something. It doesn't come out every Monday, but you can sign up on his, his email thing and you can get this motivational email every Monday where he just talks about looking at deals. I think he's out of Idaho and he has a fantastic class, Financial Freedom, I think it's called, where he just teaches you how to use a calculator. And, and, you know, again, it's COVID, eventually it'll be over and he'll go back to doing his in-person seminars and they're very affordable and it's not an upsell to a bunch of garbage and coaching and all that stuff. It's, he, he has the Jimmy Napier library that he sells at his events, but it's not pitched to you. It's there on a table and you can buy it or don't buy it. And he doesn't care. You know, he's a real estate guy, but he's, he's a great educator. So I like that guy too. Yeah, I'm taking a look at it right now. I'm probably going to, probably going to. Is that right? Gary stuff. Johnston seminars? It is. Yeah. Gary Johnston.com. Yep. Gary Johnston. Okay. Gary seminars. Johnston with a T Johnston.com. Yep, yep, yep. Great guy. Fantastic. Yep. And he actually was like one of the engineers that worked on the Hewlett Packard calculator or something. He worked for, he was the engineer for Hewlett Packard. So that's cool. Um, kind, of, kind of a cool backstory. So. Yeah. All right. So the second question is, and I think we might've answered some of this already, uh, and that is the, what is one resource, whether that's a book, course, website, whatever, that you recommend to anyone looking to get started in real estate? We've already mentioned a few, but are there any others that you think are a must? You know, we didn't have YouTube when I was, when I was getting started. That's phenomenal. Like YouTube, you can learn. I mean, you can learn brain surgery on YouTube. Like whatever you want to learn, you can learn it. Like that should be a university. You can learn everything you want to know about anything for free on YouTube. You don't need to pay anybody anything. Everything's out there. There's a bunch of great videos, a bunch of great, great, great content. Anything you want to learn about, it's there. Go and look, yeah. you know, spend your, get off Netflix, period of sacrifice, get off Netflix, just cancel your subscription to get it away from you and spend that hour every night on the treadmill, you know, walk and, you know, take care of your health, number one. 
and watch YouTube videos, right? And learn about everything you ever want to know about any aspect. Uh, if you're just getting started, Bigger Pockets is great. As you progress in the industry, it, I, I like Bigger Pockets and I want to poop them all, but you can you tend to see a lot of redundant questions asked again and again and again, and it can be a bit redundant. You know, yeah. eventually it's you know. So I, I'm 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 a love hate relationship with Bigger Pockets. So I go there and I get away, and it's free. You can get a pro account if you want, but I, I go and I'll hang out for a while, and then I get away from it for a while after seeing, you know, for the fiftieth time how to do this. Like, man, there's a search bar. Just use that. You know, and there's a lot of great groups on Facebook. You don't have to sit there and scroll through your newsfeed and read all the political garbage. <laughs> you can jump into a group and, and, you know, there's a lot of great groups. You can jump into a group and just learn about the group and, and uh, uh, what they're teaching in there and ask people questions. So there's, I mean, I can't even, I, I can't fathom how different, when I started out, it was mrlandlord.com was it. There was nothing else online. And there was email newsletters. Like you could email this entire chain of people and, and, you know, then people respond. It was like all day long emails coming in where there's like 50 emails. That was it. So it is crazy. Right. So, uh, uh, you know, and I was, I learned how to be a landlord off Mr. Landlord.com reading this old school, you know, forums where it was like, uh, the trees. Right. So they have like a, a question. There'd be like 50 responses all cascaded out. So that's how I learned to be a landlord going to Mr. Landlord.com. So. Hey, that's still here though. I just opened it up. Yeah, and I'm sure he's got great resources and stuff too. It's still out there. Probably yeah. updated. It probably looks a lot better than it was when I used it. But I, I sat at work on my lunch break. I just read MrLandlord.com and read the questions. And there's state specific stuff. You can go in and learn it. But you know, I like kind of Facebook has probably trumped a lot of that, but I'm sure there's a lot of people still watching that that site. So I there's agree. a lot of good free resources online, tons of them. Yeah. And I, I love that you said YouTube. And you, it's funny because you said it's almost a university. Oh, I refer to it as YouTube University a lot, uh, because that's Essentially, when I first decided to start kind of documenting my journey, it was like every day it was like, okay, I'm going to learn how to do this. And I would like play with it. And then when I got stuck, I'd be like, oh, let me go watch YouTube. And that yeah, was, I mean, podcasts. I mean, you know, turn the radio off. Enough of the radio. You're not a teenager anymore. Stop listening. You, you know, when you become an adult, when like the, the, you start listening to talk radio more and then you realize when you're like, man, it's all I do is listen to talk radio. What happened to me? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> I used so, to make fun of my dad for the same crap. Yeah, when I'm listening to like chipmunk speed. <laughs> like now I get upset when the when the when the when the uh, the songs interrupt the talking. Like man, I wish they'd turn that crap off. I want to get back to the talking. <laughs> oh, man. So you know, shut the music off. It's enough already, right? Enough yeah. music. We're done with that phase. Go to the podcast and listen to it in your car, right? Listen to podcasts. Uh, there's a lot of great, you know, this is great. Listen to a lot of this stuff. There's tons, everything you want to learn is for free. All of it's out there for free now. Absolutely. So. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And I made it, I made it and I'm, you know, I'm marginally intelligent. You know, I, <laughs> like I said, I joined the military to escape a life of poverty in a small hillbilly town. Uh, you know, didn't do anything spectacular in my six years in the Navy. I made it to E5, you know, mostly out of luck <laughs> six years i mean that's not that impressive <laughs> yeah, you know. and uh well to be fair i did two years of education so i got the e4 stamp for free and then you know it took me another four years to make e5 so you know, i didn't do anything spectacular i didn't have any hedge on anybody i went to a state school i used my gi bill to pay for that so i left with no college debt uh, you know, but I, I didn't have any leg up on anybody. I didn't come from a real estate family. Nobody in my my house or my family had ever sold and bought real estate. They would have any, I just, I, I got into it for an, because of an income problem. And I was always hyper-focused and I was really good at what I did. And I always try to systematize. If I do something, I don't want to have to do it again and repeat all the processes. So if there's a document that I have to use, I'm going to create that document and then save it. And then I don't have to go and create the document again. So I try to systematize things, right? So you know, focus on building. It's a business. You can run it as a hobby. That's fine. I kind of run mine as a hobby. If I did for years and now it's more of a business, but uh, you can run it as a hobby, but you can still systematize things to make them much easier to do. Right. So you don't have to do all that laborious task over and over again. So maybe you have a way you want to rehab a house or a rental house and then you just, you, you get your paints and your colors and all that. And you just do that again and again and again. So you don't have to go out and rethink this stuff every time. It's not like retailing where you got to go in and kind of figure out what's trendy and popular and what brings buyers. And so, yeah, but even with our rehabs, we, you know, we have a very systematized process, right? We, we do things in, in a standard fashion. Like we, we, we don't use the same 
materials every time, but we do the same stuff. Like in every bedroom, every bathroom, we're putting in USB outlets. We put undermount stainless steel sinks, like so they're under the granite countertops, right? So just these little extra things attract people to my property over the one down the street because that guy didn't know to put that. People are in the bathroom, like the number one, uh, I read a thing that said the the videos, the, uh, what was it now, the, the study, it was when people are using the phone, the number one thing they do on their phone is watch videos with the volume off. And that's because they're in the bathroom, right? At work or wherever. So they're you know, taking a dump and they have the volume off and they're just watching videos. And that's why if you're doing videos online, you should be putting in, uh, you should be putting in, uh, um, uh, what's the words at the bottom? Uh, captions. What did you say? Captions, yeah, you should put captions there because people are going to sit there and read it, right? So we started putting in USB outlets next to the toilet, right? <laughs> do we charge their phone that's a huge selling point like people see that in the, in the back of my mind like man that's really convenient yep. <laughs> so, i like it so i can show you i have a usb outlet in my bathroom like remodel my bathroom like gotta have a usb outlet in here man <laughs> i like that that's simple that's good all right so aaron where can people get a hold of you if they'd like to reach out i'm on facebook but if you go to facebook it's going to be less real estate and more shit talking so i like to tell <laughs> a lot of jokes and I, I like to make fun of all kinds of stuff i don't take a side in anything uh you know i'm on instagram and instagram's very focused on kind of my my mantra health wealth and stealth so i'm talking about how to how to make money how to stay rich and it's all real estate related so you know be rich stay rich and and uh, uh you know be healthy so uh, I just want you to, you know, live a good life, be, be a great person, live a good life. And you can do that. With, I, I believe anybody can do that with real estate, you know, I maybe agree. not in California much longer because it's becoming a little bit crazy for landlords, but you know, you're making a smart move and buying stuff out of state. So, uh, but you know, I'm still having fabulous success here. We're, you know, we're doing very well. So it's all about yeah, just figuring Instagram, out the niche. Yeah. Instagram, Aaron, the house buyer, A-A-R-O-N, the house buyer. Yeah. Uh, and on Facebook, it's just Aaron Masrillo. And my name's spelled right there in the corner of the video. You can write it down. It's kind of a weird, weird name. So easy to find. There's only one easy to find. So Awesome. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for joining us today. This this has been a really just really insightful episode. There's been a lot of really good stuff in here and some stuff that I I mean, some of your quotes in here, like the period of sacrifice that you can do it now or you can do it when you're old. I mean, that's a really well put together. Not, and, not, not from me. I take no credit for any, anything I've told you, I take no credit <laughs> for it. It's I've heard it all from other people. It's, this is all plagiarized. <laughs> it's just in my Regardless. head and I'm regurgitating it. Right. So I'm just passing along what other people taught me. So. Fair enough. Well, nonetheless, it may be the first time some of the listeners have heard it. It's all very, very good advice. So this has been a really good episode and I'm super excited about it. So thank you very cool. much for joining me. Thanks for having me, man. And thank you for your service and all you in the military. Thank you for your service too. I'm extremely appreciative of all of you that allow me to go do what I want to do every day. Right. So, and well, I'm not even, every time I see a, a guy, the, the old dudes with the, the, the hats <laughs> on, I stop and thank them. And you should too, because it's because yeah. only because of them that we can do stuff like this. Thank you for listening to another episode about my journey from military to millionaire. If you liked it, be sure to visit from military to millionaire.com slash podcast to subscribe to future podcasts. While you're there, we'd love for you to rate the show. Give us a review on iTunes. Now get out there and take action.